Hello everyone, Gilly here. In the last video, we implemented a very simple tic-tac-toe game, a multiplayer tic-tac-toe game. Now, one of the things we did when we implemented that was we used the term IO on the end of each of our functions that performed impure effects to indicate that they perform impure effects. Now, this is really just a convention and you know, here we're doing a print, for example. Here we're doing a read line. These depend on the real world. The read line depends on there being a terminal. Print depends on there being a terminal. Now, these things together make these functions impure. Also, there are other things that make them non-total, such as the fact that they recurse potentially infinitely. But let's not worry about that right now. Instead, let's go ahead and let's build an IO monad in order to encapsulate the effects that these perform and, well, make them pure, basically. So I've seen an IO monad implemented before. A good friend of mine implemented one, but I don't honestly remember exactly how he implemented it. So the other night I went and I kind of beat my head off the wall and figured out an implementation for one that was pretty neat and will allow us to express these effects in a pure way. So our IO type is gonna wrap a value as IO tends to do in other languages, for example, Haskell. And basically what IO is going to be is it's actually going to be a function and it's going to say, if you give me some effects, if you give me a way to do various effects, well, then I'll give you back a result of those effects in the type that IO wraps. So this might be a little weird for those of you who haven't seen it before. Basically, we're making a generic type and its underlying implementation, if you will, is going to be a function from effects to A. So what do effects look like? Well, Basically, in this program, there are only two real effects that we use. We have a read line, which takes a unit and returns back a string. So if you can't tell, effects are going to be a record or you call it a batch of operations. And then we have print line. And print line is actually the reverse. It takes a string and returns back unit. Print the string to the console and return back unit or in F-sharp terms, do nothing. So... One of the things we'll need that'll be really useful for this IO monad, uh, well, I guess it's not going to be a full monad because I'm not going to implement all of the operations, just a couple that I need, is the bind operator. Bind is typically written like this. And basically what bind does is it's going to take in a value. Now let's actually call that IO. And it's going to be an IO of some type A. And then bind takes in some kind of a function to apply to an A that gives back an IO of B. And overall, bind returns back an IO of B. All right, pretty straightforward. So what did we say an IO was? An IO is a function which takes an effect and gives back a value. So we need to return back a function which takes an effect and gives back the inner value. So how can we get an inner value? Or in other words, how can we get an IO of B. Well, actually just a B because we already have an IO because we're wrapping in a function, so to speak. So what we can do is we can apply IO or we can apply our IO here to our effect. And an IO applied to an effect will give us back this A, this inner A. So when we have an A, we can apply our F, the result of that, so that's going to give back an IO of B, but technically then we'll have an IO of IO of B because we have the effects being given here. So if we apply the effects on the end like this, well, we should have an IO of B in the end. All right, so that's actually most of our IO monad. There are a couple of functions we'll define just to make life easier for us later. Let's first define a read line function which read line is for now going to take in a unit and it's also going to take in some effects. And what's it going to do? It's going to return back basically our effects dot read line applied. So in other words, right now we're taking in a unit and we're returning back, well, an effect to string, an effect of string. Print line is going to be similar except we're taking in text and then our effects. And all it's going to do is apply print line on text. Now, you may notice that at this point, we haven't actually talked in terms of real console effectful effects. We just have this effect wrapper, if you will, that's being injected into our functions. 
and then we're calling whatever implementation is given to us later. This will allow us to express our algorithms below in a pure way without actually depending on real effects until we call later. So you may be asking, and rightfully so, how do we use these? So what we're going to do is we're going to read line here, like we did here. So we're going to read line, and then we're going to use bind. And remember, bind takes a function with the inner value. So you can call that line. And we're going to bind out that inner value, if you will. I don't know if that's the appropriate term for it, but we're going to bind out the inner value. Um, and then we're just going to use it like we normally would. So one thing to note is that this bind is going to expect the inner portion of this to return back an IO value because that's how bind works, right? It takes in a function which returns back an IO. So let's go ahead and write something. I'm going to call it pure IO. And pure IO is going to take in some kind of a value. It's going to take in some effects. It's not going to use the effects, but it's just going to return back the value. So this is kind of a way to inject something into the IO monad that isn't necessarily even IO. So we'll return our actual move here using pure IO. Now to convert our print FN, what we have to do is we have to use our new function print line, and we have to change our print FN effect to S print F, which will just do a string conversion. And of course, in this case, we don't actually care. We don't need to do a string conversion because well, it's just a string. It's already working. It's already evaluated. There's no function here. And then we need to bind out unit, which looks a little weird, but in F sharp, we don't want the next effect to apply necessarily until we've played the first one. So that's our read move IO function. Let's do the same thing for next move IO. So remember, read move IO now is going to return an IO value. It no longer returns the actual value that we need. It no longer returns the move. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to call read move IO on our letter, and then we're going to have to bind out our move. So basically, let's parse that move. And then we're going to do what we did before, but we're going to call it with move, and we need to return things appropriately here too. So we need a pure IO on new board, and then we need print line, and we're going to bind out unit there. All right, so last but not least, let's convert over our actual game loop function here, play IO. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to convert all of our prints into print lines. And this would be a case where we need to use an sprintf in order to build up the string that we previously printed. So that's how you would do the conversion here. Notice sprintf is a pure function. It takes in a value, it returns a string. It shouldn't error. It's just converting strings. It's not actually doing the effect. So fun. We don't need a value here, so we can do that. We can do the same thing here, so let's just take this code. All right, nothing too crazy. We need a couple of prints of the empty string. And to be honest, this gets a little ugly. In a lot of programming languages, this would be expressed in do notations, or as F-sharp calls in computation expressions. I'm intentionally avoiding that for this episode. So this middle part, next move IO, of course, returns an IO of the new board, of a board. So instead of binding the name like this, well, we've got to bind the name like this. Uh, using fun and then using the arrow, which is actually pretty cool. It's kind of neat to see how a let converts into a bind. So we've got more of the same here. Uh, let's go ahead and steal what we're doing up here. Put it there, put it there. Fun. And then because print line returns on IO already, we don't actually need to um, do anything with this if that makes sense. It already returns an IO of unit, and overall our game will return unit when, if it terminates. Print line here, and then play IO just recurses. Looks like I missed some indentation here now. So if I run this, let's see what happens. I expect nothing to happen, but everything should compile because, well, we've just made all the types work. So I ran it and it compiled and it worked. Um, nothing happened, of course, like I mentioned though. So 
what do we need to do to actually make it run? Well, basically, if you look at the application of Play.io to game state, this is going to be needing one thing now. It's going to be needing effects to actually run, to actually apply all of the logic of the game. So I'm going to make a new thing called console, and this will be effects. And what will the effects be? There'll be a read line, um, which is just going to do system.console.readline, as we did before. And then we'll also need print line. And then we'll just do sprintf, and it'll do percent %s to print a string. Let's de-indent that. And now, basically what we can say is let's play our game and the effects that we want to use to interpret it are the console. Oh, looks like I had a small bug here. I should have said print fn. I got confused with my conversions. Print is the one that we want because it takes a string and does an effect. So if we run it, we see now we have our good old tic-tac-toe game. It's executing as we expect and we have... I just, I just exited there, that wasn't an error. It's executing as we expect, and we now have expressed our code without having effects nested in it. It's all pure code up until we actually invoke in the very last minute here. So thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll probably do a few more segments on this problem.